Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lord of the Harvest. I want to wish all the fathers happy Father's Day. And that'll be part of what I'm going to share this morning uh, concerning our Heavenly Father. Um, as we've been praying uh, weekly, uh, leadership and others, uh, the Lord's really brought the issue of uh, keys of the kingdom to my heart. And I've been meditating on it, and I did a little bit of study today, just looking into it, what does that represent and how does that impact us at Lord of the Harvest and the progress that God has been leading us to, to becoming more of a disciple and to be able to disciple others. The keys are very important. Um, I have a devotional, uh, Henry and Richard Blackaby, that I read, and uh, they said this about the keys. It says, the keys of the kingdom represent the access you have to the Father through your relationship to Jesus Christ. I want to focus on Peter. Peter is one of my favorite apostles, disciples, because I feel like I'm like him. You know, you rush into situations, you misinterpret things, but every once in a while you get it right. And, you know, Peter got it right. And Peter is focused so much in the Gospels about getting something right uh, uh, leading up to Acts. I want to open first in uh, Matthew 14. Um, and we know this passage. Uh, I'm going to start in, um, well, in verse 20, Jesus fed the 5,000 plus. We, we know the miracle, right? And the disciples were there and gathered up the fragments and all of that. And then in verse 22, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And we know Jesus had to connect with the Father. He gave a lot out of himself, but he couldn't do what he did without hearing the Father speak and seeing the Father move. So the disciples get in the boat, and they start going to the other side. It says, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea. And, you know, if you look at geographically, the Sea of Galilee was a valley. It was a basin. It was surrounded by mountains. So the wind, the storms happened a lot. But these guys were fishermen. So they were seasoned for the water. But, you know, things happen. Uh, the boat, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter spoke up. I love Peter. He's always the first to speak up and react. And he answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. I want to stop there. Peter became a water walker. And what led him to be a water walker was his faith. He had an increase of faith. But God wasn't done with him yet. Turn to... Um, Matthew 16, 15, verse 15, starting in verse 15. So we got Matthew 16, 15. Back up one verse. So, you know, Jesus said, two verses, you know, who do men say that I am? And he calls himself the Son of Man. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And again, Peter steps out, and he says, and he answered, and he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. How did he transform from a faith water walker to having a revelation of Jesus Christ? And what I want to point out is you cannot really be a disciple if you don't have a revelation of the Father. And the only way to have a revelation of the Father is to truly know who Jesus Christ is. Peter had a revelation. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you. He was blessed that minute. Now, he wasn't blessed walking on the water. That was a pretty cool thing, pretty awesome show of faith. But he was told he was blessed 
because he had a revelation of who Jesus was. And Jesus knew the beginning of that revelation was going to lead Peter to become the very man of God, the rock that he was going to build his church on. And we see that later on in Acts. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he goes on to say, in verse 19, he says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Saints, if you want to bind and loose, you got to be blessed. Yeah. And the only way to be blessed is to have the keys. And he's only given the keys to those that know who Jesus Christ is, that he can, in relationship, reveal to us who the Father is. I want to just point a couple things out and then I'll finish. To a Hebrew, and I looked this up, okay, what does it mean to a Hebrew of that day to hear about keys of the kingdom? Well, it has a different meaning than we might interpret. They understood the term in this way. Keys to the kingdom was something very significant that happened that day to begin something to define Jesus' very purpose. You see, they weren't convinced by miracles. They saw a ton of them. They just came off a miracle. Peter just saw, you know, feeding 5, 10, 15,000 people with a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread. They weren't convinced by that. They weren't, Peter wasn't convinced by walking on the water because he also failed, you know. He began to take his eyes off of Jesus and began to fall. But something began to happen. Peter had come to the revelation of the Father through Jesus, and now as a true disciple having the keys of the kingdom, he now began to understand the laws of the kingdom. This is what's important. When you have a revelation of the Father through Jesus Christ, you become a disciple. And becoming a disciple, you begin to understand how to interpret the laws of the kingdom. You begin to be able to teach the word of the Lord, the keys and the laws of the kingdom. You begin to preach and exude. And we see that if you turn to Acts 2. And I'm going to just shorten this up. I'm not going to share everything I was going to share. I'll save it for another time, but just go to Acts 2. We know that Pentecost was poured out. It's the Holy Spirit. But look at Peter. Now he moved from a water walker to a, a, a revelatory person to see Jesus for who he truly was. Not by his miracles, not by the things he did, not even by the parables that he smoke, spoke because they didn't understand half the time. But they loved him, and the love grew and grew and grew. And look, we love the Lord, but it's not enough. We have to become disciples. And in order to become disciples, we have to have revelation. It means we have to press into God. Yes. Look at Peter, filled with the Spirit, starting in verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God the Father, you have taken by lawless hands, crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And he goes on. Peter became the rock, and he was able to distribute, teach, and preach the keys of the kingdom, and 3,000 were added that day. Pray with me. Father, this morning, we truly want to become disciples that we will get the keys to the kingdom. Lord, we want to understand and interpret the laws of the kingdom. We want to teach and preach that which you have given us, Lord God, to establish your kingdom. Thank you for the keys, Lord. Thank you they unlocked doors. Lord, you, you unlocked prison doors for Peter, Lord God. You've used that man mightily, and he is my example today. Lord, I don't want to just see miracles. I don't want to just walk on water. Lord, I want a revelation 
of the face of the Father, that my ears will be open, my eyes will be open, I will hear and I will see, and I will be obedient. For thy kingdom come, and your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That verse, Pastor spoke on this chapter a few weeks ago. If you did not hear it, you really need to re-listen to it. We are out of exile, church. This is what this verse speaks to. And um, we need to remember that we are in a new season. We need to receive it, and we need to act like it. I had a dream, I want to say, and I'm really bad. I took notes and studied it and everything. I didn't write the date down. I want to say it was December or January. Maybe it was early February. Uh, I know it was pre my cancer diagnosis, so that would have been... um, Well, then it would have had to have been December or January, because that was the end of January, beginning of February. Um, But uh, I was talking to Pastor Jan last week, and she had mentioned an eagle, and the Lord reminded me of this dream. And I knew when I got it right away that it was was prophetic and it was from the Lord, but I knew the timing wasn't right to deliver it. And I kind of did what I usually do, prayed about it, studied it a little bit, put it away, and forget about it. Um, So this is what the dream was, and then I'll go into sharing it a little bit. Um, I was standing at the corner. Joe, is that cemetery? It's on Clinton River, right? Or is that, what is that? The cemetery is on Clinton River and Garfield, right? So I'm standing on the corner of Clinton River and Garfield with, you know, a handful of other people. Don't ask me why we were standing on the corner, but we were standing there and we were talking about eagles. And I said, you know what? I can't believe I've never seen an eagle. I know all kinds of people have seen eagles in that cemetery, and I can't believe that I've never seen an eagle. And I looked over, and there was a tree that was, it was like springtime, so this tree was, was full of its leaves and everything already, but for some reason, as clear as day, there was this open spot where this eagle was. And I went, oh my gosh, look, there's an eagle. And lo and behold, as I'm saying that, another one comes, there's two now. So there's two eagles sitting there, gorgeous, majestic. Um, One was a male and one was a female, and this was very clear to me, and I'm not quite sure how I knew that, but one was quite larger, which apparently the females are larger, but, um, and then there was a male. So there was two eagles, and then that's it for the dream. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, description about, uh, just uh, about eagles. Their vision, our vision, like we all know, is 2020. That's that's about as good as you're going to get, um, typically speaking. Their vision is 20 slash four or 20 slash five. That's like incredible. And there was some science I looked into that really I don't want to get into now about why that is. How come they can see so well? But think about that. If your vision is 2025 and 2030, you notice it. Their vision is that much more. Um, improved than ours. Their, um, their degree of vision, ours is 180, theirs is 340. They can see straight ahead and to the side simultaneously. And you know, think about this in imagery for us, for the church. I mean, when I'm saying this, this isn't just science facts. Just, you know, think about how it would apply to us. Their t- talons are designed to c- carry 15 pound mule deer. That's the biggest one in record that they know. 15 pounds. Think about carrying 15, that's, that's a gallon and a half of milk. That's heavy, right? Well, that's not heavy, but you know what I mean. Um, they have no natural predators, none. They have heavy wings. If they flap around too much, they get tired. This is why they soar. When they soar, it's called a thermal current. And once again, a lot of science. I only read a little bit of that because it was just too much. Basically, it's an updraft. They basically catch that updraft 
and get above it and just the wind carries them. They, all birds do this, but um, eagles do it. Um, even as they age, they continue to um, uh, plumage. Is it plumage or plumage? Plumage. Um, and what it is is the worn out feathers, the ones that maybe get damaged, they, they fall off and they get new ones. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? But this is this, when I looked up in scripture, the imagery, what scripture says, is eagles have a divine perspective. So if you're reading about an eagle, this might be one of the things um, it means when you're reading about it in scripture. They have strength, uh, God's deliverance. And I have some verses if you guys want them after I'll give them to you. Um, it uh, describes God's throne. Think of Ezekiel and the four living creatures. They all had the face of an eagle. Speed and power. That's Isaiah 40, and we'll get back to that. Uh, the two eagles that I saw in that dream means doubling. And I believe God is going to be doubling things to us in this hour. Yes. Amen. The male and the female speak of covenant. You know they mate for life. I believe God is saying in this hour, and we have heard this already, that he will fulfill his covenant with us. So in Isaiah 40, sorry, it's going to give me a hard time. If you read through this chapter, verse 6 through 8, and like I said, Pastor spoke on this. If you haven't heard it, you really need to re-listen to it, especially now in light of this, this word. God uh, describes how we're like grass and how really we're nothing and we're weak and we're, you know, we easily fade and blow away. And don't we? I mean, don't we? Think of all the struggles that we've been having. Just in this little church, I think Pastor Rob mentioned that a few weeks ago. There's a lot going on in such a small little church about big things, right? But then in verse 9 through, um, I want to say 27, maybe, he goes on to say how awesome he is, how mighty he is, you know, how he uh, rules the heavens, his, his eyes see and created all things. I mean, he's setting us up to tell us how weak and tired we are, is he not? First he tells us our exile is over, then he tells us how we're but grass, then he starts to tell us how amazing he is, and then comes verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? He just got done saying how amazing he is. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creators of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. And you know what the Lord reminded me of with this? You know, I go every week and get chemo, obviously, and I get infused with stuff. You know what God's saying here? He's not saying, I'll increase your human strength or I'll add to your human strength. He's saying he is going to, he will, he does infuse us with what he has. It's his power. It's his strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, weary and young men exhausted. Once again, it doesn't matter who you are. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care if you're Joel Osminski and you're an awesome bodybuilder. You will grow fair, weary and faint. But, don't you love that when God does that? But, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Do you know when he says Lord in this, it's Jehovah? And we sang that song today. It's from Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. It's when Moses met Jehovah in the burning bush, and he, said, you know, he finally says, okay, if you're going to send me, who do I say is sending me? It's the great I am. Yes. The great I am 
is who we are waiting for and who are we to receive that strength from. He wants to do those same works he did with Moses in us, in this hour, I believe, in the church. I believe that, and we've said this over and over and over and over and over, there is something so powerful coming, and it will come from the great I am, I believe. Yeah. Amen. And though we go through all these things where we are weary and we are faint, we will be infused with his power and his strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Now remember I said with how heavy their wings are. Church, we bear heavy things here. If you're the pastors, this is a heavy, heavy work. If you lead a group of some type, it's a heavy work. If you pray for people, heavy, heavy work, financial burdens, loss, caring for children. Whatever you bear in Christ, discipling people, you bear a heavy burden. We can't be flapping our wings around. We can't do it. We need to take his strength and his might and soar above that updraft. And you know, when we were singing that last song, I just had my eyes closed for a while, and I just saw this eagle soaring. And it's, just think about what it would be like up there. It would be quiet, be peaceful. You wouldn't hear the cars. It would be just rest, soaring. Think of the vision that you would see so close to heaven. So I believe some of the things, oh, let me finish, sorry. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And these are the things specifically um, that the Lord spoke to me regarding that dream and in regards to this eagle. I saw them in a cemetery. And you know, there's places of death that we have to go to. And you know what I mean. I'm talking, not talking literal death. Where we, we will rise up like those eagles. And you know what? Who looks? Really? Think about what you do at a cemetery. You want to see dead things. You want to bury dead things. Who expects to see life and rejuvenation and strength and soaring and vision? out of a place of a cemetery. But God will do it. He is doing it. We will have a new apostolic authority and strength. I believe that there will be a doubling in what we have received in the past. We will not be weary. We will not be tired. I believe that there was an, a renewal of power as that um, molting uh, is going to be going on, even in our old age, and, and Pastor did, had mentioned that not long ago, um, we're going to have a divine perspective imparted to us that we haven't had before. So let's pray. Lord, you're amazing. Lord, you are amazing, and there truly is none like you. Lord, who but you, Lord, could bring light in the darkness and bring a soaring and hope and vision out of a place of death, Lord God. Lord, you have called us, Lord God to heavy, heavy things, Lord God. And, and Lord, our wings have been tired, Lord. We have grown weary. And Lord, I love how in this verse, Lord, the qualification to receive from you, to mount up his wings as eagles, Lord, is to be tired and to be weary 
and to wait, to hope on you. Lord God, we hope on you, Lord God. We wait on you, God. And Lord, we do declare we have been tired and we have been weary, Lord God. Fulfill that, Lord God, which you desire in this house, Lord God. Mount us up as wings as eagles, Lord God. Give us that sight, Lord God, that vision, that heavenly perspective, Lord God. Double portion, Lord God, into this house, Lord God. In Jesus' name, Lord God, we thank you for your body. Lord, we thank you for your blood. We thank you, Lord God, that it, this is a grace gift, Lord God, just like this promise in Isaiah, Lord God. It is mounding, 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 ever-flowing grace upon your people, Lord God, just as the cross and the resurrection is to us, Lord God. And I thank you for that, Lord. Pour out your grace, Lord God. Fill us afresh, Lord. Thank you for your body and thank you for your blood, Lord, in Jesus' name. I just um, wanted to share that um, that um, my wish to see an eagle was forever, and um, in the and and I saw the eagle at school in Clinton Township, where I work, and um, I really felt like the Lord sent that eagle to me on really which was one of my last days there, and. Um, what what um, Teresa shared was so so powerful for me personally. Um, when I looked it up, eagles' wingspans are from five feet to seven feet, and that's probably why they're so heavy. But when I saw the eagle, it was just gliding, like she described, on the currents, and I could see the white of the head. And I probably would have never noticed it, but a friend pointed it out to me which again shows the importance of being with people, with being with others. And um, so I really believe that the Lord is having this church soar. Uh, but we have to believe. We have to believe. And we have to turn our mourning into gladness. And we have to um, know that the Lord will come to us. That eagle came to me. I didn't, I didn't expect to see one where I saw it. And, and that just speaks volumes. But thank you for sharing that because that was a really powerful word. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, continue with the message to the church in Philadelphia. All right, now we'll go to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to continue looking at the church in Philadelphia. One of the five verses the Lord gave us when we planted this church over 20 years ago was that we would be the church in Philadelphia. And we use this paradigm uh, as a pattern. We use it to evaluate ourselves and we see it as the faithful promises of our Father to us. We uh, do want to say, again, Happy Father's Day. This uh, morning for our national prayer, uh, Waylon Henderson, powerful young man in the Lord from Arlington, Texas, he, he led our prayer this morning. And uh, Waylon pointed out yesterday was Juneteenth, and today is Father's Day, and so he said, he, he prayed into the combination of those two holidays that we might have freedom and that God might establish families. So we are praying for the freedom of the Lord to be manifested. We are also praying for families to be manifested and strengthened and established. I mean, starting with God's family as his being the heavenly father unto us of many sons and daughters. And then of course that that would go beyond our church family to our human families, to our, to our, our neighbors, to, to our nation, to the nations of the earth. Do it Lord in the name of Jesus. So Revelation 3, 7 begins this way, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. 
And let's point out the obvious here. Philadelphia is the it, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. This this church has a lot to do with love, the love among the brethren. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia right now, there we pointed out last week there, there are probably three key images that emerge. The first is the one who has the key of David. That's in verse 7. The second issue has to do with the breaking of the slander of the synagogue of Satan in verse 9. And the Lord breaks the slander of one group who claims to be the true covenant people on the earth and says others are not. The Lord breaks that slander by revealing his love to the church in Philadelphia. Verse 9. And then the, the third image that emerges is in verse 12. He who overcomes, he who gains the victory, he who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And of course, to be a pillar means to be uh, an established part of the very temple of God. And we know that where all of the book of Revelation is moving. It starts with a revelation of Jesus in chapter 1, and it moves toward a revelation of the new temple the heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. And so the third aspect, third major aspect that emerges in the life of the church in Philadelphia is Philadelphia becomes a pillar in the temple of the Lord. So three issues, the, the key of David, the synagogue of Satan, and the, the, the pillar in the temple of God. Now. The angel is addressed, the angel of the Church of Philadelphia, the angel would be the apostolic leadership in the church. Uh, in modern day terms, some might say the bishop of the church or the, the senior pastor of the church or the leadership team or the pastoral team. That's the angel. We're not dealing here with supernatural beings. Humans are the angels that God places in the church. They're the Lord's messengers to uh, declare his message, to impart his message, to live out his message, to pray that that message is established in the church. So these prophetic words are delivered to the angel of each church, of the seven churches. And what is stated, what is said to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, what's it's actually written by John, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. Now that's a triune title for Jesus. It's a, it's, he's the holy one, he's the authentic one, the true one, and he's the one who has the key of David. Now, each one of these churches uh, has an aspect of Jesus that is revealed in chapter 1. In chapter 1, Jesus appears. Chapter 1, Jesus is unveiled. In chapter 1, Jesus visits John, his angel, his messenger, and, and commissions John to deliver seven words to the seven churches in Asia, which would be seven churches over which John exercised uh, apostolic authority. Each one of these churches has an aspect of the vision of Jesus that comes from chapter one. Now what's interesting about this threefold revelation of Jesus, the holy one, the true one, the one who has the key of David, the holy one and the true one is not mentioned before this particular point in time. So it's, it's an unusual church in the sense that, that two of the three aspects of the vision of Jesus are not stated in the first chapter, contrary to all the other churches which their aspects come from the first chapter. 
But this one aspect, the key of David, is a reference to something in chapter 1. In chapter 1, when Jesus appears to John, in verse 17, John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of the grave and of death, the keys of death and hell. So, so there is this aspect of a key, and it's, it's tying in this idea of Jesus having the keys to death in the grave, he can unlock the grave and he can lock things up in the grave. He can, he can um, uh, un unlock death and, and, and he can lock things in death. He has authority. He has a kind of ultimate authority. And so the key of David represents this authority that Jesus has. We also know that if it's a triune designation, Jesus is the holy one, the true one, the one who has the key of David. Now that aspect is in chapter 1 because the greeting in chapter 1, it's a, it's a threefold greeting from the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. In verse 4 of chapter 1, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. There's a threefold designation of the Father. The one who is, who was, and who is to come goes back to the reference, and it was referenced uh, several times today in worship and in the word, that we're talking about that designation of the Lord that Moses saw on the mountain when Yahweh first appeared to him and commissioned Moses to go set God's people free. He said, I am that I am, or I, I am who I will be, or I will be who I will be. Depending on how you do the vowel points in that it can be any one of those ways could translate, but it's, it's just speaking the name, the Lord is the one who is. He's the self-existent one. He's the one who both is and will be, and what he is will be because of his faithfulness. So the Father, blessed is he who reads the words, who hear the words of this prophecy, keep those things which are written in it. There's this constant triunity, threefold ways of expressing things. And then again, repeating verse 4, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. There's the Father. From the seven spirits who are before his throne, there's the Spirit. If the Father is seen in a threefold dimension, the Spirit is seen in a sevenfold dimension. The threefold, obviously, always referring to triunity, the sevenfold, the seven spirits of God are in Isaiah chapter 11. It's a sevenfold spirit that comes upon the son of David. And finally, from Jesus Christ, and then there's a threefold designation of Jesus Christ. He's the faithful witness. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. So when we go back to Revelation 3, 7, the Holy One would be a reference to the Holy One of Israel, God the Father. The true one, in John's writings, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. The true one would be the Spirit. And then he who has the key of David, that's Jesus, the one who has the keys. Now, he opens and no one shuts, and he shuts and no one opens. Now we, we, we did, we spoke about that. Got, got a lot of notes here. We spoke about that last week, and we won't go into that completely, but the idea of the key of David comes from Isaiah chapter 22. You don't have to turn to it. If you didn't hear about it last week, we covered it in depth, so you can listen to last week's message. But it has to do with the replacement of one steward of the house 
with another steward of the house. The steward of the house was the second in power in Israel to the king. He had a key, and that key represented his authority, his authority to act on the part of the king. We, we might see him as a prime minister, or we might see him as a steward of the house, or we might see him as the major domo. Those were the terms we used last week. But Shebna, the steward, because Shebna is all about himself and not about seeking glory for his master's house. He's all about seeking glory for himself. He's all about seeking to promote himself. He is replaced. He's replaced by Eliakim, who will bring glory to his father's house, and his father would be the king. Eliakim replaces Shebna as the steward and is given the key. And so this picture here in Revelation 3, the fact that Jesus is designated as the one who has the key of David, has to do with a replacement of authority. Jesus is now given authority in the house. And to understand the implications of that, we, we have to look at what does it mean that he's the holy one and what does it mean that he is the true one. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm, I'm borrowing some notes here from, um, I'm borrowing some notes from, I'll do a little bit of quoting, from Peter Lightheart's commentary on the book of Revelation. Now, Lightheart refers to the fact, and we've talked about this in our study of Isaiah, that one of the key names in the, the book of Isaiah for the Lord is the Holy One of Israel. And we, we need to look at a couple early references to the Holy One of Israel uh, in the Old Covenant Scripture. So, so let's go right back to the earliest chapters in the book of Isaiah. I actually listed a number of these for the study we do on Wednesday night. But let's go back to Isaiah chapter one. There are many references to the Lord as being the Holy One or the Holy One of Israel in first Isaiah, second Isaiah, and third Isaiah. Again, a threefold pattern. He's the Holy One of Israel from the start to finish. And we just want to understand, what does it mean that the Lord is the Holy One of Israel? Well, if we're, we're going to look at three references to that, the Holy One of Israel. We're going to look at, at three references in the early chapters of Isaiah. And I have to get to Isaiah 1 now myself. In Isaiah 1, the first reference to the Holy One is not a good reference. Isaiah starts right off with rebuke and correction of Israel, the wickedness of Judah. Isaiah 1 verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, <clears throat> for the Lord has spoken, Yahweh has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. So the, the first reference is a sinful covenant people basically do not bear witness in their lives to who the Holy One of Israel actually is. Our next reference is we go to Isaiah chapter 5. And if you've done any studying of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 5 is the vineyard of the Lord. Vineyard of the Lord in Isaiah 5, 1, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. And of course, the vineyard is God's people. And then 
it, it lays out in this parabolic song, this prophetic song, how the Lord, this owner, does everything in his power to care for the vineyard. But the people of God, the vineyard, rejects the care of the Lord for their own ways. And then we drop down and verse 15 says, man is humbled, each one is brought low, the eyes of the haughty are brought low, but the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. Then shall the lambs graze as in their pasture, and the nomads shall eat among the ruins of the rich. The Lord's going to judge the vineyard, destroy the vineyard, but then the Lord in his holiness will restore the vineyard. We, and we need to understand that all through the book of Isaiah, the multiple references to the Holy One of Israel has to do with the Lord cleansing his people cleansing his temple, cleansing his house, tearing it down and raising it back up, restoring it. That's that whole issue of going into exile, returning from exile, to which Teresa referred in chapter 40. Chapter 40 begins with, okay, in the first 39 chapters, I tore that vineyard down, but I'm the Holy One of Israel and I'm going to restore it. If we continue in Chapter 5, with verse 18. Woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who draw sin as with cart ropes. They, 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 they're basically like a, a beast of burden just carrying around a cart of sin. That's how God, God views his people. Who say, let him be quick, let him speed his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and let it come that we may know it. And it's talking about how God's people may use the right words. They're calling him who he is. But they're, they're, they may use the right words, but their lives are not consistent with those words. And it's very interesting. An inconsistent Christian life is a life that wants things quick that wants things fast, that wants things now, that wants thing on, things on our terms. And again, but I, I, yeah, I know, I understand, I've been waiting this for 60 years. 60 years is quick for God. That's still demanding a quick work. The Lord says, Oz, I've given you 80 years and from year 75 to year 80, I'm gonna finally move in your life. Praise God. Let the Lord have his way. And then we continue in verse 24. Therefore, as the tongue of fire devours the stubble and as dry grass sinks down in the flame, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom go up like dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. And see, that sets the stage for the very next chapter. And that's the last chapter I want to read about the Holy One to give us this sense. This idea that the Holy One is tearing down so he can raise up. Isaiah 6, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And the one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now you may have noticed where we were talking about the Holy One of Israel. You kept seeing the Lord of hosts as well in those, just those couple references in chapter 1 and chapter 5. This converges this idea of the Holy One of Israel and the Lord of hosts. The Holy One of Israel purges his sanctuary, but the Holy One of Israel is the Lord of hosts. He is the God of armies. The Lord of hosts is Yahweh of armies. He's over the heavenly armies. And please 
American nationalistic Christians. Do you know primarily where God's army is at work? Not in establishing a nation, not in, well, we're going to make this nation great and wipe out all the ungreat nations. The Lord of hosts is involved in the war with his church. He is at war to bring holiness and righteousness and purity in his church. We can pray for our nation. There's nothing wrong with that. But God's not up there wringing his hands about what's going to happen to America. He, he is not. He is up there declaring, I'm tearing the vineyard down and I'm raising it back up yeah. that my church might be holy. So it's, it's, it's when... It's when Isaiah sees the Holy One of Israel that first and foremost he is commissioned to go forth and do the work of the Lord. By the way, holy, holy, holy is called the Trisagion. That's what it's called in, in church history. It's the threefold praise to the Holy One. And by the way, when heaven opens in chapter 4, of the book of Revelation, and John is transported to heaven, he sees the, the 24 elders and the living creatures around the throne saying what? Holy, holy, holy. We see it in Isaiah. We see it in the book of Revelation. And we continue in Isaiah 6, verse 4, and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, and this is, this, this is the true human reaction to the holiness of the Lord. When Jesus, the Holy One, as he's described in chapter 3 to the church in Philadelphia, appears to John, what does John do when he sees him? Well, we read it. I fell at his feet as dead. The holiness of the Lord brings forth this reaction in human beings whereby we are undone. And the foundations of the threshold shook. The pillars of the temple shook. To the church in Philadelphia, to him who conquers, to him who gains the victory, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And I said, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, the Holy One of Israel. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having his hand in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. When the Holy One appears, it's not to destroy the vineyard as much as it's to tear the vineyard down and to build the vineyard back up. See, even at the start of Isaiah's ministry, this is his apostolic prophetic commissioning. It's about restoration. God isn't satisfied with judgment. People who want to go around on and on, the Lord's going to judge us, the Lord's going to judge us all. Of course he's going to judge us. He's the holy God. He's going to rid us of that which, which works against his holy purposes, but he's going to do it when he redeems us. God's judgment is just like step one in a two-part procedure. He judges Jesus on the cross, because of his holiness, because Jesus becomes sin, but he raises him from the dead. God's judgment doesn't stop with the cross. Amen. It stops with resurrection. So his guilt is taken away, his sin atoned for. So the purpose of the Holy One of Israel is to accomplish this. It's to reveal himself, to banish what is unholy and unclean, and to redeem it 
atone for it. And then in the redemption atoning process, it, it isn't even a two-step process, it's a three-step process. He dies, he's raised, and then he commissions his disciples to go forth in their apostolic mission. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send, apostello. Send me out apostolically. Send me, and he said, go and say to this people. And so Isaiah's ministry begins with this whole redemptive process. And we go through 1st Isaiah through chapter 39, and it's talk about Assyria's coming to take away Israel. Babylon's coming to take away Judah. But it doesn't end there. Then from 40 to 55 in 2nd Isaiah, it's you're, you're exiled, but I'm bringing you back. And then in 56 through 66, 3rd Isaiah, and I'm going to sustain you when I bring you back. I'm not just bringing you back and saying, isn't this lovely, I brought you back. No, I'm bringing you back to rebuild the city. I'm bringing you back to rebuild the walls. I'm bringing you back to re install Zion as the place of my temple and my presence. And that's exactly what takes place in the book of Revelation. The seven churches get evaluated. The, the dragon's power is released. The political power of the beast is released. The false prophecy of the false prophet is released. The, the Seduction, materialistic seduction of the, of the human trafficking great harlot Babylon comes forth. But in the end, king of kings and lord of lords comes from heaven and builds a city. Builds walls. Puts them on the proper apostolic foundation and then establishes the lamb and the Father as the new temple. So, so I have this note, and I, I gave a note summarizing. Let me see where my note is here. I've got so many notes here. I, I wrote a note on what, is the, what was the purpose of Yom Kippur. I, I, I taught last year on Yom Kippur. The, the Day of Atonement. What was the purpose of the Day of Atonement? And, but I also tied it in with what's the purposes of the Holy One of Israel establishing His holiness in Isaiah. The cleansing of His sanctuary, His temple, and the church is the temple of the living God. The cleansing of His sanctuary allows the Holy God to dwell among an unholy people. When Jesus is seen as the Holy One for Philadelphia, he says, I'm coming to cleanse you, Philadelphia, so that I might take up a habitation, yeah. not a visitation, Amen. in your midst. See, Zion, the temple, the city, the walls, it implies permanent residence yeah. by God. Let's go back on the way to Revelation 3. Stop off in John 17. Because the, the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John 17 goes right along with the establishment of the Holy One of Israel. Look at what, what Jesus says. And we're just we're going to look at John 17, uh, verses 15 through 19. This is Jesus praying for his disciples and praying for those who will follow his disciples. In 1715, he says, I do not pray that you should take them, my disciples, out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I'll keep them. One of, one of, the, one of the promises to, um, I, better, I better get my marker here in Revelation 3. I keep pulling things out and I forget to put them back in. One of the promises to Philadelphia, the Lord says this. He says, because you have kept my command to persevere, 310 of Revelation, but stay in John 17, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world 
to test those who dwell on the earth. When we keep his word, when we keep his commandment, when we do not deny his name, when we keep his commandment, he keeps us. And he keeps Philadelphia from the hour of trial, the hour of reckoning that's coming on the earth. There was an hour of reckoning that was coming on the earth in the historical time of the church in Philadelphia. There's an hour of reckoning. It's taking place right now, brethren. And the Lord says to Philadelphia, which again, by the way, he's promised Lord of the Harvest to be a Philadelphia church, is that he will not let the church in Philadelphia succumb to the trial. He'll keep them through the trial. And that's what Keith Hazel prophesied many years ago, what it means to be a, a church, a storehouse church. A storehouse church is a church like Joseph, you know, seven years of plenty, saving up and stockpiling up for the seven years of famine. And, and what, what Joseph did in Genesis, what Joseph did at that time in history, he stockpiled things, and it wasn't just for Egypt's good, it was for everybody who yeah. came to Egypt. It was for all the nations. A storehouse church saves things up in times of plenty which are past for times of famine which are present. And it's not just to sustain Lord of the Harvest. It's to sustain others. That's what Philadelphia is. I, you have kept my word. I'll keep you. But I'm keeping you for everybody else. I'm not just keeping you for your sake. So when Jesus says in 1715, he prays, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. The phrase, keep them from the evil one in John 17 is the same as, I will keep them from the hour of trial in John or Revelation 3.10. So, so Philadelphia is a church that is responding, and res responding to and receiving the answer to Jesus' prayer in John 17, 15. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Make them holy by your truth. See, see this, is, this is the cleansing of the sanctuary allows the holy God to dwell among an unholy people. This is what it means that he's the holy one. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Truth sanctifies. We live in a truth-denying generation worldwide. Yeah. Amen. Wasn't a, it wasn't any kind of a president that, that, that uh, coined the word fake news. Fake news has been going on for a long, long, long time. Your word is truth. And my wife and I, we were praying last night. And it just, I just said, I cannot believe the inability and the unwillingness in and among the people of God to admit that they're wrong about certain things. It's unfreaking believable. Would you like 25 scriptures to show why you're wrong? How about 250 scriptures? Would you listen? Would you like an hour, an hour, an hour, an hour long episode on church history that shows why we are where we are? Let's just use common sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. The world makes accusations about the church, and the church is like, See the world, how wicked they are. No, the world's right. The accusations they're making are right, correct, and true, and you will not listen to them. And yet what makes us holy for God's habitation is that he purifies us by truth. Why isn't the primary motive in Christian's heart the truth? It doesn't... 
It doesn't matter what the truth does to me. Who cares? I was wrong. And I was wrong again. And I was wrong again, again, and again. So what? It's the truth. I'm free now. Amen. I'm free from false prophecy. I'm free from false teaching. I'm free from a false narrative. What, that, what is so hard about that? 2 Thessalonians is what's so hard. The Lord said, I will send the church a strong delusion. I will send it because they took pleasure in falsehood as my vineyard did in Isaiah 5, as my people did in Isaiah 1. But do we understand that when the Lord confronts us with truth, he does exactly what he does with Isaiah? He reveals his holiness, and that's the truth. Reveal your holiness to them by your truth. Your word is truth. See, now we've got the holy one and the true one. This is who Jesus is. The church in Philadelphia has to be a church that's very comfortable with the holiness of the Lord and the truth of the Lord. So please get over the fact that there is not an 11th commandment that says, I will always be right. It does not exist. It's not a commandment. I mean, my gosh, if you're running a machine and, oh, if you keep doing this, the machine's going to explode, you're going to be killed, and people are going to be killed around you. Why would you have a problem with somebody saying, just don't do that, do this. So the machine isn't destroyed, you don't kill yourself and everybody else. Who wouldn't be anything more than overjoyed? Thank you. But the essence of sin in Genesis is ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It means you will determine what's good and evil. Don't you tell me what's good. Don't you tell me what's evil. I'm the arbiter of ultimate truth. What I think and feel is the arbiter of ultimate truth. It's sin. That's sin. Sin is sin is not the origin of sin is not drugs, sex, abortion, homosexuality. That's not the origin of sin. The origin of sin is I will determine what is right and wrong. And that's why those other things become sins because, well, I determine that's a fetus, whatever the bleep a fetus is. I'll call it a fetus. I'll call it a mass of tissue. I'll call it that. The sin isn't, the sin doesn't begin with, oh, I want to get an abortion. I want to abort babies. It starts with, nobody's going to tell me what I can or can't do. I'll determine it. Right. Good. I just spent too much time on that. But sanctify them make them holy by your truth your word is truth and then verse 18 as you have sent me as you have sent me on an apostolic mission into the world i also have sent them on an apostolic mission to the world the holy and the true one who has the key of david commissions us in his holiness and in his truth for our apostolic mission and for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I make myself holy, that they also may make themselves holy in the truth. How did he make himself holy? He presented himself as a living sacrifice to his Father on the cross. Obedience is what makes us holy. Jesus' obedience to the Father, setting himself apart for the Father's purposes, allows us to be sanctified in the truth. So, he is the Holy One, he is the True One, and the one who has the key of David is the one who has seen the Holy One of Israel and been sanctified in his truth. Now, truth. I was commenting, and I'm, I'm, I, I was interacting with their, several brethren. We, we, we interact on this. We have this kind of this email thing. There's uh, 
four of us. And we just go back and forth and back and forth. And the ones you would know on this are Charlie Stromer, uh, Apostle Reggie Holiday, myself, and you wouldn't know the, the fourth brother. But we're talking about, he was commenting on some things, and I brought in Lightheart's commentary on Revelation. In terms of Jesus' being, he who is true, let's go back to Revelation 3 and we can kind of wrap it up there. In terms of Jesus being he who is true, in 3 verse 7, Yahweh, the Lord in the Old Testament, is also the true God because he is the faithful God. This is Peter Lightheart. Truth in the Old Testament has to do with reliability and accuracy. In Christian theology, truth is a quality that things possess. Insofar as they correspond to their creator as faithful representations of him. Now let me make a comment on that. This is what truth is. The Lord is true in his person, in his character, in his being. And anything or any word or any deed or any revelation or any proclamation or any work of faith or any doctrine or teaching that corresponds to the Lord as a faithful representation of him is truth. Truth is just demonstrating who the Lord is. God is true in the sense that, what, that he does what he says. He acts in accord with his character and promises and fulfills his purposes. Do you get that? There's, there's this idea, there's this, uh, this relationship between reliability and accuracy. God is reliable. If he says he's going to do it, he does it. If he says he's going to do it and doesn't do it, then he's not true. So what does that say about the promises we have as a church? What does that say about the promises we have as individuals? What does that say about the promises that are in Genesis all the way through Revelation in Scripture? God will fulfill his purposes. That's why he's true. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In the Gospel of John, truth is associated with the completion and fulfillment of God's purposes in his word, his son, his incarnated word, his word made flesh. That is truth, according to the Gospel of John. The word becomes flesh, and John 1, 14 says, what happens when the word who was with God and was God in heaven, the Son of the Father, we're, we're, we're in Father's Day today, uh, our, our national pastor's Zoom meeting on Friday morning is everybody bring a favorite verse about the fatherhood of God, and that we just took a couple minutes each and shared on it. Mine was the entire Gospel of John. That's my favorite word on the Father, because the entire Gospel of John shows the relationship of the Son with the Father and the Father with the Son. The Word, the Son, becomes flesh full of grace and truth. And a few verses later, grace and truth are contrasted with the law that was given through Moses. We beheld his glory full of grace and truth. And then it says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean Moses was a liar? Does it mean like the Old Testament scriptures are lies? Lightheart said Moses does not speak lies, but he does not reveal the real real. He does not reveal the true truth, which is, of course, Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life. There's truth in Moses, and there's truth in church doctrine, and there's truth in church tradition, but none of those are the true truth. What are you saying, pastors? I'm saying, I'm saying if you don't have Jesus, throw it all out. 
Donkeys can learn truth and can prophesy truth. And as Pastor Bogle said when I was a young believer, I don't expect to see that donkey who prophesied to Balaam in heaven. It's true. Moses isn't telling a lie, but Moses is the shadow of the truth. Yeah. Principles apart from Jesus are shadows. Jesus is the substance. That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. Now, Lightheart says this. The real real, the true true, the true truth which is real truth, according to John, which is Jesus, the way, the life and the truth, is the truth of the end, E-N-D, the truth of the end. Now, I, I, I made a little note here for the guys. I said, for Peter Lightheart, the end is telic. End means the true goal, the true objective, which we are moving toward in Christ. That's what the real truth is. Christ is moving us toward what? That God might be all in all. He's moving us to the truth that he's king of kings and he's lord of lords. He's moving us to the truth of in the end, God will come and make everything right. That, and that's what the book of Revelation is moving toward. It starts with an unveiling of Jesus on earth and moves us all throughout human history and, and lists every major obstacle that will come against the church in the church's in, entire history, whether Jesus is coming back in a few weeks, a few months, a few years, or in the lifetime of our children, our children's children, or our children's children's children. It doesn't matter. We're moving toward the book of Revelation where the bride comes down from heaven out of uh, comes down out from heaven from God. The bride comes, the city, the walls, the permanent habitation of God and man. That's the true goal and objective which is in Christ and, to and toward which all history moves. In John and Revelation, both, Things are what they will be. Things are what they will be. See, see, it's that famous question that Daisy Mitchell asked me in the Bible study once. Said, "Well, when is the new heavens and the new earth?" I said, "The new heavens and the new earth are now, because what will be already is, and what is is what will be. And see, real faith is just living in the truth of what God." is going to do for what is for us future. It's not future for him. It's future for us. In Revelation and John, things are what they will be. And that's a reference to I am that I am. Yeah. I am what I will be. And see, that's how we live. See, see, when I get in trouble, and again, it was another Jan rebukes Oz Knight yesterday because she reminds me that I'm not living in what will be. I'm living in my own experience right now and it's troubling and it's hurtful and it's confusing and it's discouraging. And she just said, I am what I will be. See, the book of Revelation, we're to live in it not as it's going to be, it's going to happen that way in the future. It's true right now. See, that's how Jesus did miracles. Jesus just brought the future into the now because he lived in the future. He reached into the future, brought it here, and said, be healed. A physical healing that takes place in somebody's body is not some psychic healing. It's not Christian science. It's Jesus saying that person's going to be healed in eternity. We're all going to be healed in eternity. And Jesus just reaches into eternity and by faith makes eternity present right now. Hallelujah. It's Jesus saying as he stands before the tomb of Lazarus, he says, I thank you, Father, that you hear me. See, it's Father and Son, Father's Day connection. Nobody around him is hearing Jesus. Your brother will live again. I, I, I know he'll live again, Lord, one day in the future. No, 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 no. Your brother will live again. Yeah, I, I know on the last day he'll live. 
my gosh, they're not hearing me. I thank you, Father, that you hear me. I don't say this for my sake or your sake. I mean, you know that I hear you and I know that you hear me. I'm saying it for their sake. And he reaches into what will be and says, Lazarus, come forth. What are we waiting for, brethren? So, things are what they will be in John and Revelation. The last Adam, Jesus, is the true man. The new Jerusalem is the true Eve. Truth is what is disclosed in, what, what is disclosed and unveiled in as the end. For Lightheart, truth is Christological or summed up in Christ. So we conclude in Revelation 3. This says, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Jesus is reaching in to the future, Oh, and he comes back with a key because he's the new Eliakim. He's the one. The, 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 the old Shebna is being replaced. Do we understand? And this is, this is let, me, let me quote. Um, let me see if I can find one more place. Yes. This is Lightheart. Jesus, the Holy One and the True One, has the key. He is the Holy One because, like the Holy God, the Holy One of Israel in Isaiah, he's also the Holy Priest, he's the Holy Steward, he's the Holy One, and he has a key. And the key was given to him not only to unlock the Holy House of God, but to guard it. Do you understand what Adam and Eve, what they were commissioned to do in the garden, they were to guard it. See, when, when, when you keep something, you guard something. When the Lord says, you've kept my word, you've kept my commandment, you're guarding his word, you're guarding his commandment. You're, you're, you're uh, as, as verse 11 says, behold, I'm coming quickly, hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. The Lord's given you a crown and everybody's going to want to steal it. Adam was given the task. He was created to be a guardian of the holy place, the garden, but when he sins, he's cast out, and now the angels receive the keys of the kingdom. Priests are given the task of guarding the house of the Lord in the Old Testament, but, but they're sinful, and, and, and their authority is limited. Jesus receives the key to the kingdom himself. And then he gives the keys to Peter, to his apostolic leaders, to the church. We all receive the privilege of the keys. We are all guardians of the house because we are all holy ones in the holy one. Now it's interesting that within the book of Revelation, and I can do a study on this some other time, looking at the word holy, the most frequent use of holy in the book of Revelation is in the plural. See, Jesus is the Holy One, but we are the Holy Ones. And you know what that word is? Saints. Every place where it says the prayers of the saints, the, the, the saints and the apostles and the prophets, the authority of the saints to make war, with the beast and the false prophet. They're the holy ones. We are the holy ones in the holy one because of the holy one of Israel. The holy one Jesus, who's commissioned here as the vision behind everything that the church in Philadelphia does, sees his father, who the holy one is, receives the keys from his father and then gives the keys to us. And when we have keys, we're called holy ones. 
That's what it means to be a saint. It means we have keys and we keep and we guard and we open and we unlock. And so now, seeing the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the keys of David, he gives the keys to us. Verse 8, I know your works. I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it. See, he's unlocked it in eternity, and now it's unlocked. We can go in and out. We can close it and open it. We can shut it. We can lock things in. We can unlock things out because we are the saints, the holy ones of the Most High. Even though you only have a little strength, you have, you're few in numbers, you're few in political power, and you're few in socioeconomic strength. That word means all three of those things. For you have little strength, but if you use that strength to keep my word, if you use that strength to not deny my name, if you use that strength to keep my commandment, just to persevere. It's not a difficult thing. He's not asking us to do rocket science. He's asking us, do you know what it means to persevere? Never give up. Oh, I screwed up again. Now God's going to do me in. Never give up up this horrible terrible thing happened it must be disqualifying me never give up i'm weak i'm tired i can't take this never give up that's all he commands philadelphia do you want to be a philadelphia church never give up yeah. never give up why because there's an open door there you have the key all these things that are going on in your life are obscuring reality to you, but just don't give up. Hang in there. And we're going to stop there, but the next place I'm going to go, verse 9, this is a, what? It's a, a spoiler alert, okay? Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them to come and do obeisance before you, prostrate themselves before you, bow down before you that they might know that I have loved you. The church in Philadelphia, because it has little strength, because it's not, doesn't, see the, the church in Philadelphia is not impressed with anybody because it's not impressed with itself. It's just not, it's not. The church in Philadelphia is a realistic church. It knows what it is and it knows what it isn't and it knows what it isn't is a whole lot. And it knows what it is is real simple. Jesus is in our midst. The Holy One is in our midst. But what the Lord has shown this, and again, every time I teach this passage, how many times have I taught the church in Philadelphia in the 20 plus years we've been here, probably 10 times. Every time I teach it, I see something different. And, and, and I'm always trying to figure out what's going on. The synagogue of Satan is a spirit of abuse that is at work within the people of God, whereby the people of God abuse one another. It's a spirit of abuse. And this is the way the abuse works. I'm somebody. I'm the chosen people of God. I believe this and you don't, and you're not the chosen people of God. I vote this way and you don't. I'm the true people of God and you're not. It's this abusive spirit that's at work in the body of Christ. And that abuse has to be broken. It has to be broken. And it has to be broken both in those who are the abusers, who are of the synagogue of Satan, and it has to be broken in those who are the victims of that abuse, the ones who are being slandered. Do you know, that's what blasphemy is. They blaspheme, the synagogue of Satan blasphemes the church in Smyrna and lies about the church in Philadelphia. So they're, 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 the thing that characterizes ab abusers, they're liars, okay? They make you believe that you deserve the abuse that you get. They make you believe you're worthless. 
They make you believe they're nothing, that you're nothing, and they make themselves believe that they're everything. And that spirit has bound the church. This is why the church supports abusive leaders. Honestly, I, and, and I, I mean, I was, I was just stunned. I was stunned at how people embrace the abusive leader that our former president was. He, that man is an abuser. He's, and it's just, it's, it's, again, it is as obvious as you could see. And I said, Lord, how can people abuse? And I'm not talking about who you voted for or, or, or any of that kind of stuff. People vote according to their conscience. I have people who, 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 who voted Republican because they believe in the platform. They believe they're against abortion and, and nobody's going to tell them not to vote for that. I, I don't have any problems with it. It's this support. Well, when abuse comes forth, you can do, people handle abuse one of three ways. They resist abuse, they submit to the abuse, or they become the abuser themselves. And I just said, anybody who supports that man as a leader, that's their concept of leadership, that abuse is okay. It's not okay! And some may say the same thing about the other party's president, and I wouldn't necessarily argue about that either. We're in a place in God where let God be true and every man a liar. I am, I am just, I'm so sick. I'm so sick of politics. I'm so sick of politics. But do you know, one of my favorite books, the book of Daniel. Do you know that the book of Daniel from chapter, it's 12 chapters and there's only one enemy. There's, there, there, there are two things that emerge in the book of Daniel. And if you read the, through the whole book of Daniel, this would be true. God's kingdom is what God is going to establish in the earth. That's point number one. And point number two is every enemy of the kingdom of God being established in the earth is a political entity from the start of Daniel to the end of Daniel. It's all, it's, it's political power, political power being substituted for the power of God's kingdom. We have to break this spirit of abuse that is at work in the church. It is a 1700 year phenomenon that started when Rome was converted and all of a sudden the answer to everything. Rome converted from an oppressive state against Christianity into a Christian empire. And that's when everything went downhill. Everything went downhill because all of a sudden the church that had looked to Jesus exclusively to sustain them for 300 years of persecution, being marginalized, all of a sudden they looked to the emperor and everybody, the Christians who were walking in truth, the Christians who were walking in false doctrine, they all went running into the, in, into the emperor and said, support us against them make our make our doctrine great again come on let's do it and you know that constantly went back and forth one minute he's siding with the arians next minute he's siding with the christians next minute he said and they just and and can you imagine what it does to a man to see himself as god Amen. 1700 years abuse and the church has submitted to it or the church has become it but we must resist it we must resist it with the power of the gospel the keys of the kingdom the holy spirit with grace with the word of god we need to be gracious to all men we need to pray for our abusive leaders whatever political party they're in, and we need to 
ask God. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I, this is the right time to get a couple things in. I'm going to finish with this. I've been studying about the civil rights movement. Juneteenth and things. I mean, it does things to your, your, your head, and you're like, I, I, I got to study this. I got to read this. I got to understand this. I got to find out. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spearheaded the civil rights movement, you know what the church said to Dr. King? I'm talking about the church, the whole church, not just the black church, the whole church. They said, Martin, Martin, don't do this. Wait, let's wait for the Supreme Court to end Jim Crow, to end discrimination. The Supreme Court will do it. Let's wait for the Supreme Court to, oh, and you know, we got to elect those presidents who appoint people in the Supreme Court to put an end to discrimination. There was one man, he was, he was the only white man on the Southern Christian Leadership Council. They allowed, they, they put a white man in there. His name was Will Campbell. Will D. Campbell, and he had some kind of high position at, at the University of Mississippi. And of course, we know, I mean, those, those Southern universities were the bastions of, of discrimination. And Will got on there and Will said, there's a sin that we are guilty of. It's making an idol out of the Supreme Court. The church had to take it into their own hands. A little parallel to abortion Oh, we gotta, get, we gotta get those presidents in who'll get pro-life justices to end abortion. Well, they never ended discrimination. The church took that on. Church, we need to take on abortion. Unlock the key. We need to unlock the key. We need to unlock the key. By the way, and I, I quoted this verse, I, I, I love this. This is what Will Campbell said. He, 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 this old white Southern guy, who interestingly enough, when he, when he left the civil rights movement, you know what he did? He went back and ministered to so-called KKK Christians. He said, this is where God wants me to go. I gotta bring the gospel to those people. I, I gotta get them to see. He had a, a Will Campbell had a, um, he had a good friend who was an atheist, who was a journalist. And the, he said this guy would always really push him hard, would push him really hard. And uh, challenge him and challenge his views and challenge his understanding about the Lord and challenge, and he did challenge him. This guy was, was, was really bright. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's good to have some friends who, who, who don't believe in the Lord, who can push you and push you. Oh, it's good to have brothers and sisters in Christ who believe something different from what you do. And they can push you and push you. He asked Will Campbell, this journalist, he said, can you sum up Christianity in 10 words or less? Will thought, he said, we're all bastards, but God loves us anyways. Amen. Do you think that's a vision of Isaiah in, 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 in chapter 6? And I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and I said, we're all bastards, and the Lord loves us anyways. So you can wait for the Supreme Court, you can wait for the president, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Wow, I went, I went way too long, Lord, but I said what I needed to say. Grant us 
your grace, Father, that we might be the holy ones, the saints of the Most High, in the Holy One. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.